Thank you and welcome to Evolving Systems 2019 Second Quarter Results Conference Call. As you may have seen, our Form 10-K was filed after market closed today and our press release was just issued. Joining us from management today will be Matthew Stecker, Evolving Systems Chief Executive Officer and Executive Chairman, and Mark Sinkowski, Evolving Systems Senior Vice President of Finance. On today's call, Mark will provide an update on the quarter, and Matthew will update you on the business investment activities currently underway. Both Mark and Matthew will be available during the Q&A portion of the call. Before I turn the call over to Matthew, I'd like to remind everyone that the company will be making forward-looking statements based on current expectations, estimates, and projections that are subject to risk, specifically statements about future revenue, expenses, cash, taxes, and the company's growth strategy are forward-looking statements. Listeners should not place undue reliance on these statements. There are many factors that could cause actual results to differ materially from our forward-looking statements, and we encourage you to review our publicly filed documents, including our SEC filings, news releases, and website for more information about the company. At this time, I would like to turn the call over to Matthew Stecker for some opening comments. Matthew? Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. You know, when we do the, uh, this call that includes the year-end financial results, it always marks the longest time since we've done an update. And since, we've, since it's been some time since we've done it, uh, the world has been a little bit busy. So we have a lot of updates for you today. It may go a little longer than we traditionally have, so hopefully you'll be patient with that. Um, but we anticipated at the end of the third quarter, the headline today is that fourth quarter revenues rose from the preceding quarter. Based on a lot of hard work behind the scenes, it had been our expectation that our business would begin an upward trend after a lengthy period focused on internal investment and consolidation of our multiple acquired companies. The project of improving evolving systems remains ongoing, and we continue to execute on plans to consolidate and leverage the leadership position we have within the two product families we sell to wireless carriers around the world. As a key milestone, we're proud to be able to announce today that we have generated positive cash flow from our operations in the year 2019. While the revenues for the year were down from 2018, our fourth quarter rose from third quarter, which, as I said, reflects our new trajectory. I did want to emphasize before I turn it over to Mark that the operating loss of $7.9 million and net loss of $9.7 million for the year ending 2019 that we're reporting today was almost completely related to the goodwill impairment we announced in the second quarter of the year. Excluding the goodwill impairment, operating loss would have been $1.2 million and net loss would have been $3.0 million for the year ended December 31. So what does it mean when we say that the Google impairment was triggered solely due to the market capitalization of our common stock? We look at the value of these intangibles from multiple aspects, and all the fundamental valuation tests would not have required an impairment. In other words, we think the value of the acquisitions we've made remains strong. That said, there are various rules and guidances that make it hard for a company and for the auditors to allow their company to carry goodwill in excess of a company's public market cap. So at the end of the day, rather than spending our time fighting auditors and accountants, it was easier to write down those assets and spend our cycles focused on our products and on our customers. We have now written off all the large tranches of goodwill left, making it unlikely that we will have to repeat this exercise. And so going forward, it is likely that the headline number of numbers will more closely track with our actual operating results. I bring up the goodwill impairment because it obscures the underlying progress we've made this year and the tangible evidence in the fourth quarter of an upward turnaround in our performance. I've said in previous investor calls, we're starting to see concrete signs of a turnaround in the business, and while this has taken about six months longer than anticipated, it is now starting to show on the balance sheet. There is good reason for optimism about the company's future. The impairment has no impact on our business, its outlook, or prospects. The investments we made in the company between 2016 and 2018 are now showing returns, with deal now, deals now in the later stages of the sales pipeline, some closed during closing. You will have noticed a number of media announcements recently that attest to that fact. It's a frustrating feature of our business that the carriers we've worked with tend to be reluctant to have their names publicized in press releases. So it's often that our press releases are necessarily anonymized. Nevertheless, they represent good news. 
and they also back up the well-founded optimism about where the company stands today. I appreciate that it's hard for you guys as investors to judge the impact on our stock value when we have a release that says we want to contract with an unnamed large operator whose size isn't defined. Usually we can't give either of those pieces of information out. Generally, though, I would take the flow of these announcements as indication of the ongoing health of the company's deal flow. If a particular deal has a transformational quality, we'll call it out. Still, however frustrating these anonymized releases are, I hope you'll agree that they are preferable to a background of silence. From a fundamental strategic perspective, we are nearing the completion of retiring the debt taken on to purchase Lumada, BLS, and SSM. Looking forward, if we are able to continue executing, we see a path towards a continued debt-free, profitable, evolving systems with our, within our current products and profile. In reflecting on 2019, we overcame a large number of challenges and milestones operationally. The major and complex rebuild of our offering and customer value management and loyalty was time-consuming, but the result of that work, the Evolution Platform, has now been implemented at its first customer site. Turning four products with four complicated code bases into one updated, fully functional solution was not straightforward, but we can now market and sell our coherent and unified offering capable of supporting multiple relevant in-demand use cases. Interestingly, several of these are highly relevant in the face of the ongoing coronavirus pandemic, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Our activation and network services solutions were, as we have previously discussed, repackaged into a package we call the eSIM Lifecycle Management Suite in 2019, and its component products were updated with significant new version releases for Tertio, Smart Dealer, and DSA. Our investment in marketing last year has yielded multiple opportunities, including a substantial new customer win. Over the past 24 months, we have built an evolving system that can continue to compete in the telecom market today. Digitization, the advent of eSIM, and other trends are including the ongoing, and even including the ongoing global situation, all influence operators' buying decisions when it comes to enabling software that we can address, often for the first time. As a result, I'm confidently anticipating that 2020 will see a continuation of the upward trend started in the fourth quarter. Finally, I'd like to take the opportunity to discuss the viral elephant in the room and touch on how the global coronavirus outbreak is impacting us. The good news is that we're a company that has been built on a distributed foundation. Our people serve a global footprint of operators and are themselves vastly decentralized. Our global footprint is much larger than most companies our size due to the nature of our work. A positive effect of this existing profile is that we have been both running our own business and interacting with our key customers through telework and other remote technologies for years. Our key meetings and internal processes have for a long time been designed for remote participation. In recent weeks, we have leveraged this internal ability by extending it to provide support remotely to our clients and prospects. As such, the present global situation has had a relatively limited effect on our existing operations. We've had some staffed offices that have had to move to remote work, including in India, in New York, and in the UK, but this has caused us to simply extend rather than create processes for supporting that work. I'll talk more about this after Mark goes through the numbers, but in general, we've been on the low end of the spectrum of impact from the current situation. All of us at Evolving remain focused on growing our business and creating long-term value while continuing to meet our clients' needs. Again, I'll discuss these developments in a little bit more detail and from a different aspect later in the call, but first, let's start with an overview of the second quarter. And for that, uh, sorry, <laughs> of the year and the quarter, at this point, to do that, I'll hand it over to Mark. Thank you, Matthew. Good evening, everyone. Let's run through the numbers. Uh, let me start with the fourth quarter. It was good, as Matthew mentioned, to see revenues trend up from the third quarter. But looking at the quarterly comparison over the same three-month period of last year, 2018, the total revenue for the fourth quarter ended December 31st, 2019, was $6.7 million, as compared to $6.9 million from a year ago, a decrease of $0.2 million, or just 3.4%. Mainly driving this decrease was the higher revenues associated with the project work and clients acquired from the acquisitions at the end of 2017, and the work went on through 2018, offset by this year new implementations and upgrades that we have begun. Total operating expenses for the fourth quarter 2019 were $4.2 million compared to $4.5 million, excluding any of the goodwill impairments from the fourth quarter of last year. 
The decrease is mostly related to a reduction in product development as staff has begun working on the project deliverable work and shifted away from the product development work. The company reported an operating income of $0.1 million for the fourth quarter ending December 31st, 2019, compared to $0.2 million operating income, again excluding that impairment loss from the prior year. Adjusted EBITDA for the fourth quarter, December 31st, 2019, was $0.4 million, as compared to the adjusted EBITDA of $0.6 million in the fourth quarter ended December 31st, 2018. Moving on to the year-over-year results, let's start with the balance sheet. Cash and cash equivalents as of December 31st were approximately $3.1 million as opposed to $6.7 million in last year. The net allowance for doubtful uh, the accounts receivable and the net allowance for doubtful accounts was $6.7 million, a decrease of $1 million or approximately 13.2% compared to last year. Working capital decreased $4.3 million, or approximately 53%, to $3.8 million from $8.1 million. As a de- the decrease in the working capital is related to the decrease in the cash, the contract receivables, the unbilled prior work in progress, partially offset by the decrease in the current term loan payable and accounts payable and accrued liabilities. They also to note is there is very little long-term debt left as when we updated the amendments with the bank and um, we had a $1 million payoff making that loan near repayment. Working capital was also decreased by recording the liability of $0.4 million related to the adoption of accounting standard ASU 2016 on topic 842 about accounting for leases. The company continues to generate positive cash flow from operations and has made timely all of its scheduled loan payments to East West Bank. Moving on to the results from operations, total revenue for the year ended December 31st, 2019 was $25.8 million, a 15.9% decrease compared to last year. Most of this decrease was in the services revenue. As we discussed earlier, many of the, many of the ongoing project work was completed from the acquired companies as well as some of the client relationships after the acquisition ended in 2018. The company reported gross profit margins, excluding depreciation and amortization, of approximately 66.3% as compared to a gross profit of 66.2% for the years ended December 31st, 2019-2018, respectively. The company continues to assign staff when they're available to work on support uh, efforts internally and product development. As noted earlier, As a result of the significant decline in the market capitalization this year and in prior years, there was a significant non-cash charge for impairment of goodwill for the remaining carrier value of $6.7 million in the second quarter of this year. And as noted previously, it was $17.8 million in the fourth quarter of December 31st, 2018. Total operating expenses were $25 million for this year ended. Excluding the goodwill impairment, the, co- the company's operating expenses were $18.3 million, which decreased approximately $0.2 million or 1.4% as compared to $18.5 million in the corresponding year ago, excluding that 2018 goodwill impairment. The decrease was primarily related to the reduction in professional fees, lower legal fees, and lower incentive compensation as compared to the prior year but was offset by our increased focus on product development and growing our global business development team in tandem with additional marketing efforts. To highlight again, the company excluding any goodwill impairments from both 19 and 18 had an operating loss of 1.2 million and a net loss of 0.3 million for the year ended December 31st, 2019, compared to operating income of 1.8 million and net income of 3 million for the same year year period of year ended December 31st, 2018. The company reported adjusted earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization EBITDA of point adjusted EBITDA of 0.3 million compared to 3.6 million for the this respective year end last year. The company strategically invests the portions of its profits in continuing initiatives to foster long term growth. I will now turn it back over to Matthew. Thank you. Okay, Mark, thank you very much. 
So with these results in mind, and to underline what I said earlier, I am confident the company has been passing through an inflection point in terms of performance and that the track we are on will continue to deliver the upward trend in revenues we saw in the fourth quarter. The turnaround of the past 12 to 18 months isn't totally complete, but the hard graft is now largely behind us. The foundations are laid. Of course, as we move into 2020, there are still some unknowns with respect to the coronavirus situation. I previously discussed how we as an operating entity are continuing with business largely as usual. Our customers continue to use our products and pay for them, and we continue to service them with the excellence we've become to be known for. For us, the largest practical impact has been to our traditional modes of sales and business development. New sales for us has historically meant sending highly trained specialists onto airplanes and to have them converse with telecom operators spread out around the world. That traditional process has obviously ground to a temporary halt. Still, we aren't sitting on our hands. We are quickly working with our current and prospective clients to find new ways to communicate about, to sell, and to service our products. There are cases where remote activation really can help operators whose retail operations have blinked out of existence. Our CVM platforms can help our operators communicate rapidly changing offers and programs to their customers in real time. Look out for a media article to appear shortly describing the specific ways that operators can use our tools to address novel COVID-19 related needs. We've also developed our own marketing literature addressing this topic that we are communicating to our clients even as we speak. All of that said, however, while the good news is that our existing products and revenue streams continue to run at full speed, we have seen in many carriers a blanket freeze on new initiatives. In some cases, where implementation and installation work of scheduled new products requires people to be on-site physically to wire or install equipment or to be in labs, et cetera, um, or where we need the support of carrier personnel, those initiatives are being delayed. Because of the length of our sales cycle, it will take some time to understand the impact of the coronavirus on our sales and business development and the effectiveness of the mitigations we put in place. As we sort through our business development challenges, we are simultaneously just beginning to look at the impact of various government programs and opportunities specific to the COVID situation. Frankly, with the earnings released now behind us, we plan to turn significant horsepower towards understanding and evaluating how recent legal and regulatory changes, as well as new government programs, could benefit us across the many countries that comprise our footprint. My hope is that by the time we speak again with you next quarter, we will have some concrete updates about this. Returning for a second to the more regular part of our business, our 2019 released evolution platform, about which I've spoken about often, is now live and contributing to the bottom line. This year, we will see it proliferate both to existing customers as they migrate to new technology and as new ones arrive. Our go-to-market for the new offering positions evolving as a leading partner in digital innovation. Our customer activation and network services business also transitioned its product lineup in 2019. The eSIM lifecycle management suite now clearly articulates our unique ability to help carriers keep pace with the evolution of SIM functionality, including the advent of the eSIM and the SIM both central to their businesses and as a result is resonating with clients and prospects alike. In terms of sales, we continue the work of presenting our new product lineup to the market. Clearly, coronavirus adds to the challenge of closing deals if decision makers are no longer closely assembled. And though this is a store, I might said, we're weathering pretty effectively from an operational perspective, it's probably reasonable to expect sales cycles to be somewhat extended in 2020. As I already said, however, we've seen a number of win announcements and we expect that trend to continue. So to summarize, 2019 ended on a good note for evolving. As, as ever, much work remains to be done to optimize our own performance, but we have strong foundations to build on. In this new world where movement is temporarily restricted, the coming months will see an increased focus on digital marketing with investments in search engine optimization and traditional as well as social media efforts as we fine tune operations to accommodate the present operational realities. I'm confident our performance will continue to trend in the right direction. We are in growth mode, and that is good news for all of us. I previously said that the plan in 2019 was solely to work internally on the company's products and pipeline. We've done that, and now we see the market starting to respond. There is, however, a significant gap between how we see the company, its performance and prospects, and the way it is viewed by the markets. But we expect that gap to begin to close in 2020 as that trend beds in. 
As a result, we will start turning increased attention to finding places to tell the evolving story to large and small audiences in the investor community. I know there's been a lot of pain felt around the decline in our stock price. In particular, the volatility around the COVID situation hit in what for us is the longest period where we're quiet while we wait to file our year and results. It also forces a blackout period that hasn't allowed any of us as management to individually take advantage of the stock price being so low. With no information, the market assumes the worst. Hopefully, after this call, once you've made it clear that the business is relatively resilient to the pandemic and is trending in the right direction from our perspective, we can claw back some of the ground we've lost due to that uncertainty. In short, we have everything we need in the toolbox that if we wield it very precisely, we can continue to see organic progress and begin moving towards sustained results. This is not an easy enterprise to run. Our clients are demanding, they are dispersed, and our products are highly specialized. We have learned how to make those ingredients work together, and I think the future will allow us to continue demonstrating that. While we're assessing the COVID impact, we still have a place, we have come to a place where a rel run evolving systems can start being consistent about performance. I want to thank all of you for your support and look forward to updating you uh, both as a group and individually in our continued progress. At this point, I'd like to be able to turn the call and open it to questions. Operator? Thank you. And as a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, to ask a question, we need to press star one on your telephone. To withdraw your question, please press the pound key. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. And it is at this time I'm not showing any questions on the phone line. I'll take that as a high compliment for the comprehensive job we did in addressing all anticipated questions. And we do have a we do have one question uh, uh -huh. from the line from the line of Mark Stiegel with Stanfield Capital. Your line is now open. Yeah, hi guys. Uh thank you. I'm glad I'm not leaving you uh too lonely on this call. Um couple couple of questions. Logistically, you have these big offices in India. I, I understand India's it looks like on lockdown. How are all those guys working who were normally in that, you know, five, six thousand square foot office? Uh thanks for the question. So we have not one but two offices in India. Um the traditional part of evolving has its kind of main operational office in Bangalore and uh, the former SSM had an office um, in Calcutta uh, that we still operate for our CBM group. Um, as I said before, we had been, because most of the rest of our offices around the world do a lot of telework, um, most of our people who are not in India uh, telework on a daily basis. And so for us, uh, we were able to uh, prepare for those folks doing telework by uh, increasing the bandwidth we had to, especially the Bangalore office, uh, we did a day of trial tests where we asked everyone to stay home before it was mandated so we could make sure that people could work from home. And notably, we have not closed or put our office on lockdown. So our policy there is that we are encouraging everyone to work from home. If they need something or they need to reboot a server, they're welcome to come into the office. And, you know, as a result, and we've been kind of keeping a tight eye on how, as I said, the few offices that have been physical have transitioned to remote work, we have not experienced a decrease in productivity as a result. So those people are working from home? Is that what you're saying? That's correct. They're all, they're okay. all doing the same, the same programming jobs they were and the same software quality and monitoring, you know, depending on whether, whatever they were in, QA, testing, um, they all have the tools to do what they're doing remotely. Okay, great. Good. Thank you. So one more question, and this is a, a much bigger uh, picture question, and you probably get this all the time. And by the way, we're relatively uh, new investors here. We've, you know, been buying this for the last maybe three months or so, and, you know, we're still losing money like everyone else, but it hasn't it hasn't been horrible. But this is my question. Um, I mean, you have this this tiny little company you're probably doing – I mean, just call it a million a year in free cash flow ballpark. It, it probably costs you, and correct me if I'm wrong, but to be a standalone public company with all the legal stuff and the accounting stuff and then a C-suite and all that stuff, that could cost $2 million a year. I mean, it, it seems that you would be such an obvious strategic 
acquisition for somebody looking to pick up 65% gross margin revenue. And, you know, at two bucks a share, or more than two bucks a share, they'd be paying only one times revenue for you, and then, and yet that would be a triple in the stock price. So, at what point is there a strategic process and you sell this thing to, to some company looking to pick up cheap revenue, which for us as shareholders is a massive percentage increase in the stock? It's a it's a really good question, and one thing I'll tell you is that when the you know the stock price went from you know six bucks a share uh, <laughs> down to you know eighty cents a share uh, for essentially the same business, um, you know the difference really was us paying a dividend versus not. Um, we got a lot of when we continue to generate a lot of unsolicited strategic input. It's often hard, I think, for people to as much as you'd like to tell them, listen. You know, because of some very complicated factors, the the, mar- the public markets have beat us up. Um, but if you value this on any traditional valuation set of valuation metrics, right, where would you come to? What is a business that's doing these metrics worth? And, you know, I'll give you some guidance. Um, you know, depending on we, – we run a pretty tight ship, both in terms of our, our public accounting and all that. You know, rough numbers, it's probably about a million dollars we spend um, – in direct costs for being a publicly traded company. So an acquirer could potentially either lose all of that or lose half of that if they still needed audited financials. I mean, those are rough numbers, of course, um, but that's... Well, then, but then there's another number, another million from having a, a C-suite, right? So, uh, you know, ballpark. So that's two million, and then there's a million of free cash flow. So call it a million. So you've got a $3 million company, right? If a guy came in and paid, I don't know, even two bucks a share here, he'd be buying this thing for, for what? Like, you know, eight times free cash. I mean, it would be a steal for him, but it would be a hell of a good deal for shareholders who now have a 70 cent stock. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm sorry, but yeah, good. Yeah, no, look, it's, it's a, it's a point well taken, right? I mean, I, I think you'll get no argument that our size, um, you know, we, we spend, a, you know, this thing would clean up a lot and become a, a different business if we didn't have those those public costs. And, you know, that thesis is out there, and there have been people who have explored it from time to time. Um, and, look, you know, I I think that from us, from internally, right, where we've been for the last 18 months, two years, is repaying the debt that we had uh, at, for having done the acquisitions that we did. Now that that's ending and the debt's almost retired, I think it's going to be a moment in the business where we can kind of turn our attention to think more strategically about what we do, what we want to do going forward. Because practically speaking, the debt covenants we had and continue to have through later in the year, uh, you know, they haven't really allowed us to do anything other than business as usual. Um, But again, we do see some interest in time to time. I mean, if you're asking rhetorically why there isn't more interest, people who have a thesis like that, and I, I probably would argue about the the extra overhead in our C-suite, you know, other than me and Mark, that is that is the C-suite. We're both super active day-to-day in keeping our business going. But, uh, okay. uh, look, I, I think that, uh, look, I think there there could be some synergies there for someone who wanted to do that. You know, a lot of evolving investors have been on it for a long term, and, and they currently, you know, I, I do the round speaking to big investors, and, and there are some folks who have the same thesis you do. You know, hey, why don't you go and try someone to take this out for a, a quick hit? Uh, some folks have been along and, and you know, want to see a long organic rebuild back up to the levels we were a few years ago. And so I think that's a good discussion that we'll continue to have, and it's, a, it's good to be able to have it. Yeah, I mean, look, I don't know if I'm a big investor, but I guess we have around 500,000 shares of stock. So, you know, that's it's a – it's a meaningful percentage of the company, even if it's not that much money. So, you know, there's 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 my vote right there. You know, so, I mean, well, listen, I, listen, so I, I appreciate the perspective. And, and by the way, I would encourage you if you want to reach to our investors relation line. Uh, you know, we, we'd love to take some time and, and meet with you and answer your questions privately, as as we do for any investors who want to take advantage of that. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly would, would love to continue to get your input. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Thank you. 
And just a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, to ask a question, we need to press star one on your touchtone telephone. And I'm not showing any further questions on the phone line. And back to you, Matthew. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating, and you may now disconnect.